It's sure good to be able to stand up here and look out and see all your happy, sunshiny faces. I look back and uh, I tell them stories about different things that happened. And uh, I, I wonder about some of the things, the wide exaggeration that are taking place more in the day. And, uh, it's always interesting to find out what's going on. I'm glad to have Ashley with us. She's back with the kids right now. But uh, uh, I had a surprise in my life. I had no idea that Noah was as big as he is. <laughs> I, I, I looked and I said, ah, how, <laughs> how big he's got. It's always good. During the past several weeks, we have been looking at biblical trinities. Uh, it has amazed me as I have started this particular study to find out how many interesting and dramatic Trinities that you find in the Bible. We, we've talked about different things. Last week we talked about lust, sin, and death, biblical LSD, or the three steps to hell. The, the days, I don't know why, I cannot get this thought out of my mind. And it is taken directly, wholly, and completely from the book of Revelation. Now, I don't like to make a disclaimer before I preach a sermon, but I'm going to do so right now. I want to honestly say that I believe that what I'm going to preach this morning is going to be based upon opinion. It's going to be based upon my interpretation. And as such, you have every right to disagree with me if you do. I, 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 I'm not going to say that I'm uh, be dogmatic enough like some people do, that I have a thorough understanding of the book of Revelation. I would be lying to you if I would to make that comment. But I, I find there's a lot of things in the book of Revelation that are interesting. Now, there are different ways of looking at the book of Revelation. First of all, there are some people who believe that the book of Revelation begins on the day of Pentecost and goes all the way through church history in a progressive way over and over again until it reaches the end of time and uh, ushering in of eternity. There are other people, and I happen to be a part of this particular group, that believe that each series of vision that John went through is repetitive. Each one starts at the book uh, of the day of Pentecost and goes up to a certain period of time of which it ends. Then it goes back and go to do it. And you put if you put all these together, you get a complete picture of what's going to take place during the church age. And the way I always explain this, in my opinion, uh, you'd be watching on these old-time westerns. And all of a sudden, the people are being uh, surrounded by the Indians, or whatever you want to say. Then the scene changes. And meanwhile, back at the ranch. <laughs> and I think a lot of times in the book of Revelation, it gives you a series of visions that are taking place. And then it says, meanwhile, this is what's taking place elsewhere. And by putting all these together, you get a complete picture. It is interesting to also find out that a lot of people believe that uh, the whole idea of the book of Revelation is the idea of, of it starts at another period of time. I've seen I've talked to some people that believe that the book of Revelation begins with the Reformation under Martin Luther. Uh, others believe it began with the holiness movement uh, that took place under some of the Church of God and some of the others. So there's a whole bunch of different opinions and different ideas expressed by this. Now I happen to believe that no matter what your particular view of the book of Revelation is, that it will fulfill a wonderful experience for you if you happen to read it. Because it, what it does, it gives you strength to realize that God is in control and that there's help to be able to overcome all things for what the Bible tells us to do. In other words, no matter what view you have, you read the book of Revelation and apply those views to what you're reading and what you're studying in your own particular life, you're going to find strength. You're going to find guidance. You're going to find comfort. And you're going to be able to be reap benefits from the book of Revelation no matter what view you may have. This morning, I want to talk to you about the 12th chapter of the book of Revelation and the verses that fall to 13 through 19. And because there's a very, very beautiful picture here 
And I'm going to give you, based my sermon upon what I believe and what I have studied and what I have experienced in my own particular life. But in the 12th chapter of the book of Revelation, you will find that it begins with the idea that there was a woman, which is representing the church, both in uh, a type and antitype, that gives birth to a male child. And that male child, in my opinion, happens to be Jesus Christ. And throughout this particular thing, the dragon, which is representing of Satan, is trying his best to, uh, be, to, to devour and to destroy the child, and the child is snatched up into heaven, which would be the ascension of Jesus Christ after his resurrection. And then the dragon turns its attention <coughs> to the woman and her other children. The other children would be us. There are several things I think are important in the 12th chapter of the book of Revelation. And uh, again, we're talking opinion, that I'll give you any information you have need on this later on. But you find that when uh, Jesus ascends up into heaven, that there is a war in heaven in which Michael and the dragon fight. And Satan, which is representing the dragon, is cast out of heaven. And I personally believe that it is at that time, not sometime in the creation time, not sometimes pre-creation, but it was at that time that Satan was cast out of heaven. And the reason I believe that is found, uh, found in the 10th and 11th verses of the book of 12th chapter. It says, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God, God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser who is Satan, for the accuser of our brother is cast out, which accused him before our God day and night, and they overcame him by, notice what it says, by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto, the, unto his death. I want you to notice that according to the testimony of the Bible itself, if I am right in placing this in the idea of the beginning of the church, and I think I am, that it was only by the blood of the Lamb, the blood of Jesus Christ, which he shed at Calvary, that Satan was being able to be cast out of heaven. Not before, not after. And the accuser of the brother, our, the person that accuses us day and night, is cast out of heaven and replaced by our advocate, who is Jesus Christ, the righteous. That's so beautiful to me. No longer is man being accused before God by Satan, but man is being pled for by our mediator, Jesus Christ. Because Satan, who was the accuser of man, is now replaced by Jesus, the advocate. I think that's so beautiful. And after we find, read all of this, we find in the 13th chapter of the book of Revelation that Satan calls forth three different henchmen to do battle against the church, the children of the world. And I, I think it's important that we kind of have an understanding of who these are. The first one is a great beast. Listen to the very first part of Revelation 13, chapter, verses 1 through 3. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. Upon the horns are ten crowns, upon the head, heads the, the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were on the feet of, as the feet of the bear. And his mouth has the mouth of a lion, and the dragon which gave him power in his seat and great authority. And I saw one of the heads as it was wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. That wound, by the way, happened to be the death of Christ. Think just for a moment. You, you think, and I, I, I'm going to try to summarize because of lack of time. You think for a moment about all the pictures that you have in prophetic language about uh, governments, political power. In, in the book of Daniel, there was this great image that Nebuchadnezzar saw, the, the head of uh, 
uh, gold and the uh, chest and the arms of silver and the breastplate of uh, uh, the loins girt about with brass and then the legs of iron, representing the various political powers of the earth. And what we find here is one of the henchmen that Satan is using happens to be political power. You think just for a moment. After the church was brought into being on the day of Pentecost back in 30 AD, the first people that rose up against the church was the political politics of the Jews. And it thoroughly switched over to the politics of the Roman Empire. And down through the years, political governments were against the church. And you find that Hitler was part of this. And we talk about Mussolini, we can talk about different things that are happening in our world today. Communism, political power against the church. Today you look at some of the things that are taking place over the Middle East with the government of, uh, of Iraq and the uh, Afghanistan, Af excuse me, Afghanistan, I'm not going to pronounce that word for a minute, <clears throat> but all of this, political power. And I, I, I'm neither Democrat nor Republican, I've said that many, many times. But I think see things taking place in our government today that are anti-church, anti-Christ, don't you? Don't you? And I, I feel that as we look at all these things taking place, that what we're experiencing today is what the church has experienced from the day it was brought into being on the day of Pentecost. Now for now, political power is against the church. Political power happens to be one of the henchmen that is being used by Satan to defeat the church if he could. The little beast and the second henchman. And I beheld another beast coming up upon the earth, coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb. And he spoke like a dragon. He spake as a dragon. I want you to think about that just for a moment. Why two horns? Satan's power is not equal to that of God. And his red power will be represented by the three horns, the Father, Son, and the Spirit. But yet, on the other hand, he's, he had the two horns as a lamb. Paul made a comment in writing in 2 Corinthians. He said, then Satan himself transformed himself into an angel of light in order to be able to deceive the church. But he spake as a dragon, which is not the untruth of the scriptures. He is also called a false prophet. In Revelation 16, 13, and 19, 20. And again, by looking at the prophetic language from elsewhere, where we know what has been done and how it has fulfilled in the Word of God, I, th I think you see here a corrupted form of teaching. In Galatians, the first chapter, we find uh, Paul writing to the church of Galatians and says, I marvel that you're so removed and following after another gospel. And he says, whether an angel from heaven or any other creature preach any other gospel unto you, let him be accursed. Every time I read that, I think of uh, the Mormon church with the idea of the angel Moraney <coughs> supposedly giving them both the Mormons. Well, then there's a lot of false teaching in the church. Just because somebody calls himself Christian does not make them a Christian. The true and unadulterated church is represented to us in God's word and we as Christians must follow what God teaches and not what man teaches. I know there are many, many churches today that will accept the idea of evolution, which I do not. I know there are many churches today that will accept the idea of homosexuality, which I do not. Well, I accept the homosexual, I do not accept the idea of homosexuality. There's, there's a lot of thinking. The idea of churches superseding and giving authority over that of which is revealed in God's word is an enemy, a henchman of Satan. 
As Satan goes about trying to deceive even the elect to be king. But the third henchman is the harlot woman found in Revelation, the 17th chapter, verses 3 through 7. And he says, So he carried me away in the spirit of the into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and color, scarlet color, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of ammunitions and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a written mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and that abominations of the earth. And I saw a woman drunken with the blood of saints, with the blood of martyrs, of, of Jesus. When I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman, of the beast, and carry her, which with seven heads and ten horns. Brother, I'm not going to get involved too much with what was revealed. It's in the Bible if you want to read it. But notice it's called Babylon. Confusion. Uh, notice the emphasis is again uh, uh, through the study of the uh, other passages of Scripture which relate to this particular idea. All these are false teaching. False testimonies. I was listening the other day when I was sitting in the house all by myself to the Inspiration Channel. Not, not the Day Star, but the other one. Which they have a different programs on that I like to watch. But this man was preaching in a camp meeting. I had no idea who he was. And one of the statements he made was, I don't care what the Bible says, I know what God has told me. And then I wish you would have heard what he said. Completely wrong. Contradicting in the very foundation of what the Bible teaches. And I think Satan uses false teaching. He tells lies. And he tries to deceive the heart of man by what he says. You go back to the third chapter of the book of Genesis. One of the most interesting passages of Scripture is when the serpent, or Satan in the form of a serpent, came to Eve and talked about her the tree of knowledge of good and evil. There were two things that Satan said there. He said, if you eat of that tree, surely you won't die a lie. Because Jesus, God said that they would. <clears throat> In other words, Satan called Jesus a God a liar. And then he made a comment. Satan made a comment to you. For he knows that if you eat of that tree of life, the tree, of the, knowledge, excuse me, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that you will become as gods. There is a strong movement today in the world today that is emphasized on the fact that if you follow up this particular teaching, you will become evolved into God. In, in fact, if you study, you will find that to be true. I could write a book. If we're talking about governments that are opposed to the church, we're talking about false teaching, religions, that are opposed to the testimony of the, of the saints. We're talking about people that are embracing false lies in order to be able to justify their own lifestyle. And these are Satan's tools to get us to fall short of God's glory. I, I, I've come to several conclusions as I thought about this particular message. Number one, Satan is doing his best to destroy the church today. He is using false science such as evolution or whatever you want to call it, humanism. 
He is using every means he can be able to fight against the church and destroy the influence of the church in our nation, in our, in our community. And we as Christians, we need to fight the good fight of faith. Remember what Paul said when he faced death. I am ready to be offered. I have fought a good fight. I have kept the course. I've done everything I could. Henceforth, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. As Christians, as Christians, let us realize that the end time comes, and it's coming, that these henchmen will be destroyed. Satan himself will be bound and destroyed. And only the church will reign supreme for all eternity. Again, I, I, I'm not sure whether you agree with what I said or not, but one thing is for sure. We need to live for Jesus no matter what happens in our life. We're going to be singing our song of invitation. Is it just as I am? I could find you, Marilyn, but we're not. And just as I am, if there's any here that needs to make a confession and come to Jesus, we invite you to come as we stand. Let's see.